Today, today we we'll do discussion on STBN Ulangan paper in year 2021, section A. Let's begin. Question one, we have an insulated conducting sphere of radius R carries charge negative Q. So which graph shows the variation of electric potential with distance from the center of the sphere? So we learned about this before that we have the graph for this one for the positive charge. So the electric potential increase when it is drawn near to the surface of the conducting sphere and then it maintain a constant value because there is no electric field inside the conducting sphere. So for here we have the answer D because it is a negative charge. So all the values are in negative. So next we move on to question number two. A system of charges 3Q, positive Q and negative Q is distributed in the region. So if a Gaussian is assumed to enclose the positive 3Q and P is a point on the surface as shown in the diagram. So which is true about the system of the charges. So we learn about the Gaussian surface in Gauss law that is used to derive the electric field strength. So the Gaussian surface here is not the good one as we need the charge to be at the center of the Gaussian surface, but it is okay. So from the definition of the Gauss law, we have the total electric flux is equal to the total charge enclosed by the surface divided by the permittivity of the medium. So let's read through the answer. Electric field strength at P depends on positive 3Q. This is not true because we learned how to calculate the resultant electric field strength. Okay, we need also to include the effect by the positive Q and also the negative Q to obtain the resultant electric field strength. B, electric field strength on the Gaussian surface is the same? No. Electric field strength inside the Gaussian surface is the same? No. Okay, this only happened to a conducting sphere that inside the sphere, electric field strength is zero. So they are, they are the same. Okay, so answer D, net flux through the Gaussian surface depends on the positive 3Q. Yes, okay, this is the only correct answer among these four options. But the net flux through the Gaussian surface is also depending on the permittivity. So this, can also, this answer also can be improved, but so far this is the most correct answer for this question. We move on to question number three. The capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor increases when? So we learn about the formula. C is equal to the permittivity multiplied area of the plate divided by the distance separation. So smaller matter are used. No, okay, it will decrease the capacitance. Separation increases, no, okay, it also decreases the capacitance. So potential difference across the plates increases, no, okay, this is only increase the, oh, sorry, decrease the charge stored in the capacitor. Okay, insulator, also known as the dielectric, can increase the capacitance. So answer is D. Move on to the next question, question number four. So we have four identical capacitors arranged in four different ways. So which arrangement shows the decreasing order of effective capacitance? So we have learned how to calculate, calculate the effective capacitance. So for P, it is a capacitor in parallel. So the way to calculate is similar as the resistance in series. So we just add four of the capacitance, which is 4C. And then for Q, what we do is C divided by 4 equal to 0.25C. And for R, here we have 3C, so we calculate 1 over 3 plus 1 reciprocal, and you will get 0.75C. And for S, we have 1C, we have 2C, and 1C in series. So we just do the calculation, and you will get 0.4C. And then we're going to arrange them from the largest to the smallest, P, R, S, Q. So P, R, S, Q, answer is D. So we move on to question number five. When the potential difference between two points on the conductor is directly proportional to the distance, electric field in the conductor is, so this is about the variations when V is proportional to the distance. And we learn about the formula V equal to ED. So the electric field strength should be the constant variable in this case. So answer is B. Question number six. Which statement is true about the decrease in electrical conductivity of a metal when the temperature increases? So we learned about the conductivity formula. It is equal to Ne squared T over M. So the decrease in the conductivity of the metal is due to the time between the collision is decreasing. 
Okay, when the temperature increase, matter atom vibrate more vigorously. So this reduces the path travel by the electron. So the time between the collision is decreasing. Okay, so density of free electron decreases. No, this is not happening. Random speed also no. Okay, the mean free path of free electron. So this is referring to the distance travel by the free electron. So it is decreasing, correct? Okay, the mean time between the collision increases, no? Okay, so the answer is C. Move on to question seven. So we have a battery of EMF 12 volt and an internal resistance of five times 10 for negative two ohm is connected to a resistor of two ohm. What is the potential difference and the power dissipated of the battery? So this is about the internal resistance and this is the standard circuit that we have. So the potential difference across the battery is equal to the potential difference across the resistor. So to obtain the potential difference across the battery, we also can obtain the potential difference across the resistor using the formula of the potential divided. So we have 12 volt battery, so the potential difference expect to be lower than 12 volt because there is a voltage drop across the internal resistance. So the answer is either A or B. And of course, we can do the verifications on the potential difference. What we do is just apply the potential divider that we have two ohm divided by the total resistance two plus. So this is 0 0.05 ohm. Multiply 12 volt. So the potential difference across the battery is 11.7. And about the power dissipated of the battery, it is actually the power dissipated by the internal resistance. So to do this, we need to obtain the voltage across the internal resistance, which is 12 minus the 11.7. And then what we can do is use the formula of V squared over R. So V squared divided, divided by the resistance 0 0.05, it is equal to 1.711. So the answer is A. So now we're going to question number eight. So a shunt which converts milliammeter to ammeter is connected in parallel to a milliammeter. Okay, with resistance 20 ohm. So the full scale deflection of milliammeter is one milliampere. If the required FSD is one ampere, what is the resistance of RF? So we learned about this before. So if the full scale deflection of milliammeter is one milliampere, means that the maximum current flow through the ammeter is one milliampere. So the rest of the current, which is 1 minus 1 milli, flows through the resistor, 0 0.999 ampere. So now we're going to calculate the resist resistance of R. So they are in parallel. So the voltage across these two components should be equal. So we have V1 equal to V2, and we apply the formula of V equal to IR. So the current 1 milli ampere multiply the resistance of the milliammeter, 20 ohm, divide by the current through the resistor, 0 0.999, which is equal to 0 0.02 ohm. So we learned about the shunt that it should have as small as possible value of resistance. So this is a logic answer. So now we move on to question number nine. Magnitude of magnetic flux density is the magnetic force acting on Earth. So this is about definitions. So we learn about the magnetic force on the conductor and also the unit charge, that the force on the conductor is equal to ILB. So the definition of the magnetic flux density is equal to F, the magnetic force acting on a, un a unit current and also a unit length of the conductor. For the unit charge, we have QVB, that the definition for the magnetic flux density is equal to the magnetic force on the unit charge with a unit of velocity. So if we compare the answer from A, from a to D, so perpendicular is uh, definitely correct, okay? And the along direction is, of course, should be wrong. So now we compare, we have a unit of current, a unit of speed, a unit of charge, but the conductor is, seems to be a less confidence, okay? Less convincing. So the most correct answer for this question is D, and to improve the answer A, the definition that's stated in answer A, it should be a unit length of a unit length of conductor carries a current of one ampere perpendicular with the magnetic field. So this question is testing you about the definition of 
the magnetic flux density. So now we move on to question 10. So a magnetic field is produced by a solenoid which carries a current of 10 ampere. So it has the length of 50 centimeter with 5,000 turns. What is the magnetic field in the solenoid? So we learn about the formula and you should memorize the formula. So it is equal to mu ni, where the mu is the permeability, shift constant of 33, multiply the number of turns per length, which we have the 5,000 turns for 50 centimeter. So multiply 5,000 divided by 0 0.5 meter. And then we multiply the current 10 ampere. So we have 1.3 times 10 to our negative one Tesla, answer is D. Now we move on to question 11. Two long parallel wire of 2.5 centimeter apart carry currents of 2.5 and 3.5 respectively. So what is the force per unit length between both wires? So here is about the force between wires. So we have different direction of current flow, so we will expect a repulsive force. So we can use the Fleming left-hand rule and also the right-hand grid rule to further verify about this. But if you do remember, it will be faster your solutions. So now we only need to calculate the magnitude. So you need to remember the formula or you need to derive about it. So force is equal to ILB and the magnetic flux density due to the wire is provided by the Ampere's law. That is equal to mu naught I divided by 2 pi R. So substitute the magnetic flux density into the force and you will get the formula easily. So when you apply the formula that we have the permeability, multiply both current 2.5, multiply 3.5, divide by 2 pi and the distance, which is 2.5 centimeter or 0 0.025 meter. And you will get seven times 10 per negative five Newton per meter. So the answer is B. Next, so we move on to question 12. A bar magnet moved with a constant speed into a coil and induce an EMF in the coil. The bar magnet is then withdrawn with, via the same path with a constant speed of half of the previous velocity and induce an EMF E2 in the coil. What is the relation between E2 and E1? So this is about the Faraday's law and also the Lenz law that we have E is equal to negative V V D T. So if you learn about it before that, uh, when we have the bar magnet moving in or moving out, when you do the directions and you obtain that the E is equal to negative N V L V. So the negative sign here is actually given by the Lenz law that it is opposed to the change of magnetic flux. And we can see that the first case is moving in and the second case is moving up. So you expect a different direction of the induced CMF. And since the speed, okay, we can see the speed is different. So here we could see that E is proportional to the velocity. So with half of the speed, we will produce a half of the induced CMF and also in the opposite direction. So the answer is C. Then we move on to question 13. So two insulated wires are wound onto a common cardboard cylinder of length 0 0.5 meter and a cross-sectional area of 0 0.05 meter square to form two coins. The number of turns in the coin are 1,500 and 500 respectively. What is the mutual inductance between the two coins? So you need to remember the formula or you do the derivations. So it's simple. So magnetic flux density in the coin is mu naught and I. And we do the direction starting from the phi equal to mi, or you can start with the E is equal to negative d phi dt. Okay, so we do the further der derivations that the phi is equal to nba, and then you substitute the b, which you, which you will get this expression. And then you do rearranging the formula, and you will get this formula. So it is, uh, you need to practice more on the derivations. So now I'm going to use it to calculate the mutual inductance. So we have the permeability, multiply the number of turns, 1,500, multiply 500, multiply the area, 0 0.05, divide by the length, which is uh, 0 0.5 meter. And you will get the answer as 0 0.094 or 94 milli Henry. So for this question, it's actually a bit blurred because we do not have the diagram. 
So we only learn about this case that the, both the coils are wound and they are aligned in the center. So this is the only case that we learn for the scope of the STPM. So this, uh, this will be the only formula that we can use to calculate the mutual inductance between the two coins. So that's all. So we proceed to question 14. Resistor or resistant R is connected to an AC voltage. If the frequency of voltage supply is double, what is the resistance? So you should understand that resistance doesn't depend on the frequency. So it should be maintained the same as R. So frequency only influence the reactance of conductor or the capacitor. And you should be clear that frequency also don't affect the inductance or the capacitance, but affect their reactance. So be careful with this. So we move on to the last question. We have alternating current dynamo produce an electric power of 20, uh, sorry, 200 kilowatt at root mean square voltage, 10 kilowatt. Power is transmitted through a cable of resistance 5 ohm. What is the power dissipated by the cable? So this is a little bit confusing, but actually it's not. So what we know is that it produces an electric power of 200 kilowatt and with a voltage of 10 kilowatt. So from here, we can get the value of the current, which is power equal to Vi. So the power 200 kilo divided by the voltage. And you will get the current as 20 ampere. So the current is 20 ampere and the current is flow through the cable. It is flowing through the cable with resistance of 5 ohm. So power dissipated by the cable should be I square R. So the current square multiply the resistance and you will get 2000 watt. So which is answer at C. So this all for the section A for Ulangan paper 2021. So hope to see you again in future. Thank you for watching.